We want to be people who love others. That's the goal. But uh, sometimes in order to get there, we got to cut through a lot of truth. It's painful, it's difficult, but it's necessary. You did it, so we do it too. And we just pray for uh, people who are watching, pray for our staff, and uh, people who are involved in the program tonight, especially Seth, it's his birthday. And uh, so bless him. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. God recognizes birthdays. So we had a man scheduled, John Hadjasek. And he was going to come in with some truly interesting claims, but John had some type of emergency pop up. He wasn't able to get into town. Perhaps we'll see him another time. Next week, April 9th, we have the pleasure of sitting with Dave Donaldson. He runs a ministry to uh, uh, prisons and uh, really great insights on how Jesus has changed lives in the incarcerated uh, people and in his own life, actually. Uh, and so uh, Christy Johnson, that's her cousin, set uh, Dave up with uh, me to come on the show. So that's going to be great. And then on April 16th, we have Nicole. What? Oh. I get the big bucks. Right. It was in my crotch. I wonder, I wonder what kind of message you were hearing. Set me free. Set me free. <laughs> Oh, man. <laughs> Listen, uh, Dave Donaldson will be here next week. He does a prison ministry. Then on April 16th, Nicole Wade, she's my friend, and she uh, is going to take us into the heart of the addicted per addictive personality. And uh, so many people struggle with uh, addictions of some sort or another, and she really has lived a life of it. So it's going to be interesting there. Before we get into tonight's review uh, of the Lee Baker's departure from the faith, Lee and Kathy Baker, I want to take a minute and thank those of you who support the ministry uh, through your prayers and those of you who choose to support us through your hard-earned financial contributions. Uh, you have a lot of choices out there, good choices, that you can support. So we're very grateful when you choose to uh, include us in, uh, in those things. Uh, I want you to know that they allow us to do what we do. And we don't live high on the hog. We keep a simple, straightforward ministry uh, trying to help people who are seekers of truth. So uh, your sacrifices of prayer and, uh, and those who are able and in the place, able to and in the place to help financially, uh, uh, really help us expose deceptions wherever they lie in the religious world. As an FYI, since announcing the TVAR last October, uh, we've made our first major pass through the book of Mark and the book of Luke, which is one of the longest New Testament uh, books. And uh, the results are going to be epic. I can guarantee you, when you see the end result, it is going to be uh, something else. So uh, a lot of information in this new uh, Testament ver transversional uh, approach. So stay with us. Tell your friends about the ministry. Keep us in your prayers. Uh, we covet them earnestly. So if you've watched this for any time, you know that we s strongly support three ministries, uh, Talking to Mormons, Ex-Mormon Files with Bishop Earl, and more recently, checkmychurch.org. I love all three of them. Uh, I got to tell you, Sarah's Check My Church is invaluable at looking at the underbelly of church playing that goes on in Idaho and Utah. And I am so proud of her efforts to expose corruption in the ranks of churches and their associated pastors. Yes, pastors uh, who ought to be feeding the sheep rather than fleecing them of their time and allegiances and money and helping them become liberated in Christ completely, not bogged down by uh, dogmas and doctrines of man. Uh, Sarah sent me a questionnaire, like she sends other churches. I promptly filled it out, total transparency. Her group gave campus the coveted House of God endorsement. That's the highest endorsement you can get. And it's not because Sarah tunes into campus. She lives in Idaho. And it's not because I know her personally. She, I passed, campus passed, and she gave us the house of God. I sincerely believe that if she found anything that was not right, she would have given us the house of fraud. That's the other thing that she gives. Other house of God endorsements have been given to Christian Life Assembly of God in Payson. And you know what that says? A, a church of God in Christ or a, their charismatic assembly, their tongue speakers. So she's not, she's not 
holding her prejudices or, or my prejudices or anybody else's prejudices against these churches, she gave them a, uh, a thumbs up. Calvary Chapel, Severe Valley in Richfield, Utah, showing that she is not against chain churches like Calvary Chapels. She gave them a thumbs up. She also gave the House of God rating to Redemption Hill Church in Saratoga Springs, Utah. So if you live out there and you watch the show, check out Saratoga Springs. She is proving she wants to support churches that don't prey upon their members, are not materialistic, they aren't legalistic, and they are there to help people become free, emancipated in their life, not under burden. Of the churches she warns about, she has two categories, money and materialism and legalistic and lawful on their members. Gospel Grace Church and Capital Church in Salt Lake got the legalistic church stamp. And when it comes to money and materialism, uh, guess what churches in Utah have so far gotten that one? The Adventure Church in Draper, the Rock Church in Draper, South Mountain Community Church in Draper, and K2 Church in Murray. So, yes, Murray. Uh, on the one hand, we've got churches that throw, they throw down the law on people, and on the other hand, we got churches that are always pushing for money. I mean, she goes and listens to their sermons. Their, their parishioners will say, go and listen when this last week our pastor talked about money, we know, but go and listen to some others. So she goes and listen to them and they, they, all, they throw money in every time. All the time they're announcing. I got an announcement here from K2. The whole back thing's on money. It's on, fi on money, money, money. You know, just think about Jesus. Just think about he had no place to rest his head. Just think about his approach that, his apostles' approach to money. Who's the guy who was after money? Judas. He held the bag, and he's the one who betrayed the Lord. That's what money does to people when it comes to religion. And so we got these churches that somehow justify it like mad. I'm telling you, I've said it before. I'll say it again. These things are going to put uh, evangelicalism, if you want to call it, to death in America. Our kids or our grandkids are not going to put up with this crap. They're not going to be manipulated anymore. They're not going to hear the pastor praying for money and then seeing that he goes on his third vacation to Hawaii uh, in five years and say, we're paying for it. We make minimum wage and our pastor's making a couple hundred grand a year. They're not going to put up with it. So, um, but you know what? I don't think the pastors today care. I think they're playing it until the well runs dry. And they're going to keep playing it out until they've destroyed what uh, the brick and mortar churches could have been in this country. Understand, my war is not against the flesh and blood pastors. It's against the emblems of spiritual corruption that lays in their heart. I know this is strong, but our Lord and Savior did it. I mean, we say, follow Jesus, follow Jesus, do what Jesus does. Well, guess what Jesus did? When it came to religious charlatans, he threw down on those suckers like no other, you see. But, oh, no, you can't do that. That's hurting the church. Look it. We should be throwing down on the charlatans. That's what we do. We throw down on them. Jesus did it. He's our king, our Lord, our Savior, our example. We do what Jesus does. Oh, no, no, we, we don't do that. Yes, we do. I mean, when they tried to trick Jesus, he called them Hippocrates. That is a strong, ugly word, you hypocrites. That's Matthew 22, 18. In Matthew 23, 4, he said, you Pharisees, you scribes, you bind heavy burdens that are heavy to be borne on men's shoulders, but you yourselves will not lift one finger to move it. I, I mean, that, that really depicts some of those fatheads sitting up on their stands and, and making sure that they burden people with whatever dream they're trying to pass off. How many of these pastors are guilty of that? Jesus also said to those people of his day, all their work they do to be seen of men. They make broad their phylacteries and enlarge the borders of their garments and love the uppermost rooms at the feasts and the chief seats at the Christian concerts and greetings in the markets to be seen of men and hear, Pastor, Pastor. He said, they devour widows' houses. That means they take widows' money. 
And for a pretense, they make long prayers. Oh, God. Oh, God in heaven, hallowed be thy name. We've seen them on TV. They, they are charlatans, and they're preying on people in the name of God. He said, you guys will cover land and sea to make a proselyte. But you may, and when you get them in your clutches, they become double the child of hell that you are. I mean, we can see it happen. It happens all the time. He, Jesus called them at this point blind guides and fools. He said, you strain at gnats, you swallow camels, and that as hypocrites, you make the outside of the cup uh, and of the platter clean, but within you're full of extortion and excess. Inside, you're full of extortion and excess. You know what extortion is? Extortion is to stand up above a crowd and tell them that God wants them to pay their tithes. That's what extortion is. That's extortion using God's name. That tithing is something the Lord expects his children to pay. I mean, we've got expenses, folks, says Terry Long at Calvary Chapel. We got expenses. Do you want us to get rid of our children's program? Well, then you need to bone up. I mean, their, their, their budget's only $2.2 million a year. You know, we're going to lose our children's program if you don't buck up, says Terry. He says that. You know, this is a money-making game. And they're at it. And they're Pharisees, just like Jesus called out. Jesus looked at their exteriors, calling them hypocrites, and says, you're whited sepulchers. And you are indeed beautiful outward, but within you are full of dead men's bones and all uncleanliness. This is Jesus talking, our Lord, who set the example, didn't he? Didn't he set the example? He calls them serpents and a generation of vipers. And he wonders how on earth they're going to escape Gehenna, where all the refuse and trash is burned there in Jerusalem. Again, our example as a Christian is given by the Lord and King. I don't see any reason why we shouldn't embrace that example. I'll stand before him and say, you did it, you're my Lord, I followed you, they, they deserved it. When you tie materialism, I don't care what the people want. If the people want a big uh, ornate building because they want to be comfortable in the summer and in the winter, too damn bad. Get space heaters and drop your budget by a couple mil. This gospel is not tied to money. It's not tied to materialism. It's not tied to the law. And it's not tied to covenants that bind people under it. We came to this state 14 years ago to help free people who are Mormons from religious bondage. What did we find? Religious bloodsuckers looming out on the fringes, waiting for the people to come out of Mormonism and step into their clutches so that they can put back on them almost all the rules they had when they were LDS. They don't preach the good news. They preach another gospel they preach another God, in my estimation. And while they might praise Jesus in the worship, they always take that praise and add to it. They add church to it. They add rights to it, obedience to it, sacrifice for the church to it, religious dreams of the pastor to Jesus. Shame on you, vipers. Shame on you, fleecing flocks, for failing to liberate people in the name of Jesus. Failing to liberate them completely from the vestiges of controlling religion. That's what Jesus did when he showed up. He was liberating the Jews, and the religiosity of the leaders hated him for it. They crucified him for it. He came to set the captives free. Why the hard line? Well, Jesus loved the Jews. They were his brethren. And when he came, he was pissed that these people were putting his brethren in bondage. When we got to this state, I got really pissed at what the churches are doing to those brethren of mine who are still in the Mormon church. They come out and they see the falsehood of that religion. They understand something about Jesus, and then they get sorely disappointed by what's out there for them, which should be something beautiful. 
Us former Mormon folks, we came from extreme religious uh, manipulation. It was a religion that gave us our own traditions, you know, with its history and its own rules. It gave us a new God. It gave us a different Jesus. It gave us a, a, a new revised temple and all the rituals and rites. It gave, gave us tithes and offerings and demands for allegiance. We complied. We tried. Served the mission. Married the temple. Uh, we constantly tried to measure up. And so we serve the machine trying to make Heavenly Father be pleased with us, right? And when we saw the truth of it all, we stumbled out of that place like people coming out of a building that was on fire. 90% of our body is soul scorched by what we experienced. Our culture was destroyed when we left it. Our ideas of family, marriage, children, God, salvation, truth, utterly ravaged and torn to bits. All of us were effed over by religious rhetoric and the lies and demands of the Mormon religion given to us in the name of God himself, constantly Heavenly Father on us and what he expects. That institution up on North Temple offers up human sacrifices every freaking day, every day, and they don't care about the fallout. They care about the institution. That's what they care about. It serves itself and its needs and is always right. The institution is never wrong with Mormonism. So 10 years ago, 2009, a couple named Lee and Kathy Baker, once trapped in the legalistic money and time demanding machine of Mormonism, stumbled out of that burning building. In their communication recently released online describing their departure uh, from believing in Jesus any longer as Lord and Savior, they open the letter with the following. Just over 10 years ago, Kathy and I endured an extremely painful and emotional separation from the Mormon church. This enormous life-changing event was prompted by our discovery and realization that the foundational Mormon scriptures have been intentionally and deceptively altered, misquoted, misused, and in some cases totally fabricated to present a very specific religious theology. As a consequence of our actions, our three daughters, along with nine of our grandchildren, have completely severed all normal family and communication with us. In short, the obvious lie and deception of Mormonism has been, and most likely will continue to be, the primary reason for the destruction of our family, end quote. Now let me pause here and reiterate the fragile, tenuous state that the bakers were in when they walked out of that church. They describe it here. Did you catch the words? Extremely painful and emotional. Enormously life-changing and resulting in the destruction of our family. You got all that? You understand the mindset of the bakers? Uh, you know, few people understand it. I know we have scholars who study Mormonism and people who might have visited a ward or dated a Mormon, but unless you've been in it, unless you know that culture, it's much more than academia. And, and it's much more than just knowing what the doctrine is. It's a religion that weaves itself into everything the members have up into that point in their life. Home life, culture, social life, sex life, sin life, dances, treks, father-daughter outings, scouting, homemaking, dress and style standards, occupational choices, hair length, leadership, learning how to speak before an audience, confessions, interviews, discipline, temple worship, far, far more than just doctrine and showing up at the ward. So the bakers, who obviously love their three daughters and grandchildren and love the Mormon church, after discovering the manipulation of scripture in their faith, courageously chose to sacrifice all that they had and to go another way. Uh, 
And it's the way they did not understand when they came out of Mormonism. Few Mormons do. They don't understand the way. And so they step out into the world and they hope that somebody will teach them the way. Somebody will help them understand what the way, the truth, and the life is. Right? Unlike many LDS people who leave, who go to atheism, the bakers continued to want to seek God. They wanted to know Jesus, right? What were they met with? 30,000 explanations of 30,000 topics by 30,000 different pastors pushing 30,000 different religious bents, all of it their own program. I don't think they ever heard the good news. I really don't. I don't think they ever understood grace. I don't think they understood the Bible contextually. Coming out, they didn't know what to expect. They didn't know jack about the good news. They don't know grace. They don't know any of this. All they knew was what was presented to them. And so, like people tossed overboard in stormy seas and getting ready to drown, the bakers grabbed on to the first life ring that they could cling to. And I don't know what it was. I haven't been able to find out, but it was a religion. It was a church. I know it was pretty legalistic. I know that, that, that Lee Baker never really took that white shirt and tie off. He wore it every day to Christian church, and I think the people around him did the same. I think they were reinforcing the law. I think I'm sure they taught tithing. I'm sure they taught Jesus Christ in a certain way. I know they taught the Trinita, and I know they taught uh, uh, second coming is imminent because Lee Baker was fervent on Jesus coming back to wipe out the world. I even think he wrote papers on it. He was so fervent about it. But no one gave him the stuff that the good news is really about, the stuff that causes people to say, holy shit, I'm free. He did it for me. I, I get it. It was Jesus. It was Jesus. It, it's not me. It was him. That's all it is. Really? You don't have to worry about all these other It was Jesus. I don't think he ever got that message. But what the purveyors of modern Christianity don't understand about ex-Mormons who are truth seekers is most of us are once burned, twice shy. And so while we'll go along, I went along with Chuck Smith and, and Calvary Chapel, and I, I bought into everything, and I listened. But behind the scenes, I'll tell you, and, and I, I, I'm guessing that's is what the bakers did, we scrutinize every freaking word you say, and we look at everything you do, and we see what's behind the machine, because we've been screwed once hard and put away wet. We were over when it came to leaving Mormonism. And we stepped out of that barn and walked back into your church, and you think we're just going to be like, oh, pastor, you're so smart. You're so true. Here's my wallet. Uh-uh. No. And this generation of Mormons who are leaving and, flo and flow, they've got nowhere to go because of you guys. You guys are destroying them because most of them aren't going to stick around. If they stick around, they just sell it. They just sell their mind out and they do the program because they can't bear going through another failure in religion. But it's not because they really trust it. I don't believe. We abandon all hope and grasp what makes sense over time. And that's what the Bakers did. None of this would be happening to XLDS people or other people who came, come out of oppressive religious institutions or families or parents or whatever. None of it would happen if the pastors didn't play this cultural church playing role that they play. We would have a completely different success rate if we just taught Jesus and Jesus did it all. You see, God set it up to be this way. And I really quickly have to touch on it. it he, he made it so that the faith would be subjective. That the New Testament was when he writes his laws on individuals' hearts and minds and they get to choose for themselves how they're going to think. 
not through the Bible and literalism and reading it and making demands from it. He writes his laws on the hearts and minds. That's, that's God saying, it's between me and you. Not me and all of yous in a church. It's between me and you. You, you follow me. You listen to me. Don't listen to them. Because he's writing on your heart and your mind. He made his body after the destruction of Jerusalem a spiritual body, not a material one. And he, he made the faith subjective. It's subjectively understood. We're all at different places. You know, depending on intelligence, education, age, uh, experiences, we're at different places. God knew that. The churches want to bring you in and make you all at the same place. God says, I've written my laws on your heart. You're okay. Just walk with me. I've got it handled. I handle it for you through my son. You just relax, all right? The sin's taken care of. You just, just talk with me about your life and we'll get through this thing. No, it's not enough. He made his spirit primary. Primary. He made his words secondary and referential. We go to it to just learn and, and grow and we learn what happened historically, but his spirit is primary and the fruit of that spirit is love. That's what it is. He abolished hell. That was, a, that was an Old Testament construct. He got rid of it. He put Satan in his place. While Jesus was walking around uh, uh, in John chapter 12, he says, Satan's done. It's over. We have passages that say when he went to the cross, Satan's power was destroyed. Destroyed. Satan's done. All of it through his son. He freed us from the, the bondage of law. He freed us from the bondage of sin. He freed us from the bondage of the grave. We don't have to fear death. He made this faith unshakable by removing anything that could be shakable. That's Hebrews chapter 12. Anything that can be shaken, he removed in the new uh, covenant. That means brick and mortar religion. Pastors who are jerks, they're gone because it's all between you and God alone. But Kathy and Lee Baker were not met with this information. Uh, they weren't met with a reasonable contextual study of the scripture. They were met with more religion, more fear of a second coming BS, more hell BS, more Trinity BS, more laws, more tithes, more demands, more obedience for complicity, and frankly, more Mormonism. And I think the bakers were used to that and probably liked it. And that was what the bakers found most comfortable, so they embraced it. I'm not sure if those people have ever been able to understand what it means to be a Christian that is free. But remember what I said, ex-Mormon seekers like the bakers and like myself and others will accept the rhetoric and the traditions, but all the while we are checking the facts and looking into everything that people say. And so the bakers, having gone along with what was fed to them, kept studying. This is the next thing they wrote in the thing they posted. It's another paragraph. Quote, Today, as a result of months of biblical Hebrew study, we have chosen to leave the Christian church. This equally enormous life-changing event has been prompted by our recent discovery and realizations that the foundational Christian scriptures have also been intentionally and deceptively altered, misquoted, misused, and in some cases totally fabricated to present a very specific religious theology. If, if Lee Baker came to me and said that, I'd say, you're right. You're right. I mean, that happens with men, religion, and writing, and scripture. Of course. Well, let's talk about some other things, you know. This is dead on. After he says that, he adds a short paragraph about Christianity doing the same manipulating as Mormonism. And then he adds, and I just want you to listen to this closely. This man is studied. He is not someone who has not done his homework. We believe that many of the essential Christian doctrines, like the second coming, the Trinity, and predestination, are clear examples of the non biblical inventions of men. You're looking at a show where. In 2013, we came out and said the same thing. We've studied now. We've been Christian long enough. The Trinity? 
That's a man-made invention. Second coming, forget about it. You know, predestination, Calvinism, five-point Calvinism, no way. And the evangelicals, the mean evangelicals, they lost their shit because it hit them right at the core of what they have built up around themselves for 2,000 years on myths. Lee Baker discovered it, but he didn't have the backing of who Jesus was because of his a, a religious affiliation. So what's Lee Baker done now? He writes this. Quote, we will join the Benai Noak branch of Judaism and formally submit ourselves to the mitzvah, the laws, of that religious congregation. As such, we openly state that we do not believe that Jesus of Nazareth was the authentic Messiah. We do, however, look forward to the coming biblical Messiah, clearly spoken of through the original Hebrew scriptures. We now turn our hearts and our lives to the one and only God of Abraham, who alone, underlined in his letter, is our Savior and Redeemer. After this letter, Lee posits a number of questions that he, I know, believes really slam the door on Jesus as Lord and Messiah. And I read through them, and I thought of answering all of them on the show. Uh, there's a few you can't answer. And what you do with those is you say it's all sized up in the uh, nation of Israel being destroyed and not being true to their covenants. And so God wiped them out and those promises don't uh, pertain. But nevertheless, most of them were very easily answered, very easily answered through proper eschatology, through proper understanding of God, through proper understanding of Jesus through scripture. That's all it was. It was a simple teaching. It's nothing to do with should do's, must do's, none of that. So um, I'm glad to know that Lee and Kathy have not abandoned God altogether, uh, as many people do. Uh, and I admit that what they are doing is sort of healthy in a sense. Um, it's not to be uh, feared. We seek, and they're seeking. You go after and you look. Uh, if anybody I talk to, I'm thinking about these, think about them. Look at them. God is not afraid of truth. You seek it. But keep your mind open to what the truth is and, and what he wants to show you. Just keep seeking and, and don't be afraid. But you don't have to fear questioning. You don't have to fear doubts. Seekers find, and I hope that the bakers continue to seek and find. Perhaps the most unfortunate thing, though, about the baker story is not that they continue to seek and search with hearts for God, uh, which I know someday will lead them to Yeshua, who is God with us, but it was the online response from the mean evangelicals uh, when they posted their letter. Who just a week before were singing the praises of the bakers who had come out from that cult of Mormonism and into the true church of wherever it's located. Like the LDS once someone leaves the ranks, the mean the evangelicals go on the offense and they malign the bakers like no other. They're hellbound. They're children of the devil. Oh, so sad how beguiled they have become. Do I agree with them? Not at all. I'm sold out to Jesus as Lord and Savior through and through. But it's all the same rhetoric you get when you leave the Mormon church, when you leave any religious institution. When you leave the rock after you've been there for 12 years, when you leave any church, everybody, oh, they've gone astray. I think that she's sleeping with her boyfriend. Ah, ma, 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 ma. You know, all that stuff that has nothing to do with being a Christian. Lee Baker used those comments, and he said, you know what? After about a, three or four days of them coming in on him, he said, all these comments have proven to me that we made the right decision. You people who are my friends, you people who love me, you people who supported me have all turned on me like this so venomously. I can see I want nothing to do with you. And he disabled his Facebook account. We should be ashamed. I get so freaking embarrassed by the zealots. These cold-hearted pharisaical scribes who strain at gnats and swallow camels like the religionist Jesus addressed, calling them vipers, serpents, and hypocrites, mean evangelicals eat their own, 
and they do it in the name of God. It's pathetic. It's fugly. It's sick. In closing, I want Lee and Kathy Baker to know that they can believe whatever they want. Uh, they can take 10,000 more paths in their journey, but along the way, true Christians love them. I love them. They can become hardened atheists. I have friends who have left the faith and become atheists. I love them with all my heart. That's our job as Christians, to love and shut our effing mouths about all the criticisms that are so easy to throw at people who differ with the way we think. It's not a love for them because I'm so magnanimous. Um, it's a love that God gives me by and through faith and my allegiance to his son who puts it in me. I don't have it naturally. I used to be just like these yokels who would criticize, very much so. I want you to know that the loudest and most threatening me evangelicals who have rejected you don't re represent Jesus. They do not represent the good news. They are representing God like the Pharisees represented God with demands and threats and fears and even attempts to kill you if they could. I want you to know that there's a better explanation out there of the faith that will suffice some of the questions that you have. It's a better way because it completely allows for freedom of thought and life by and through the Spirit of God and a focus that's on loving everybody. That is the Christian focus. It's a way that would permit you to pursue the Noetic tradition with joy, trusting that God has you, trusting that God has you. And it's a way that will remove the ties that bind, the law that condemns, and the sin that kills. It's a way, it's a truth, it's the life, and that way is Yeshua. His name is Yeshua. And if you ever want to be introduced to him again, I welcome the opportunity. And until that time, God speed. Next week, Dave Donaldson and his remarkable story of how Jesus stepped into his life, an LDS man, when he least expected it, and has put him full time into working with prisoners and the miracles he's seen Yeshua, Jesus, do in their lives. See you next week here on Heart of the Matter.